Guys, I'm super excited for this episode. Welcome. Let's get that out of the way. Welcome. We do that in reverse order. This is something that I've always wanted to do. Like before we had the podcast, before I was ever even out there speaking publicly, I always wanted to do some sort of segment or maybe write a book or something. In in my mind, I always pictured it as like demystifying the occult. Well, unfortunately, that's already a book. So the next best thing, which I think is better really, is introducing a new segment. So we internally were very hype over the uh, spirit science segment, yeah. which obviously we're going to record another one too yeah. um, here after this one. But anyway, so like launching spirit science is allowing us to springboard into this new segment, wisdom traditions. So what I want to do with this is go through all of the ancient wisdom traditions that are shrouded in mystery. And sort of like dissect them, you know, and go into the nitty gritty, the history of them, the beliefs, the doctrines, the esoteric symbolism and all that stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just something that I've kind of been like building up my mind to do the whole time. Look back it's, on our... It's like an opportunity, like a lot of times we'll breeze past a lot of these wisdom traditions or maybe talk about them for a little bit, you know, or whatever. And This is our opportunity to give each one of these traditions like time for us to really dive deep and give people a more full picture of what these wisdom traditions are about, you know, the history of them. We're like compartmentalizing it all into one episode so that if if you're like, man, I really want to know what the Rosicrucians are about. Exactly. Or, or, man, I really want to see what's up with the Essenes. You're already here. but (laughs) I'm I'm really excited for this, too, because Ryan's been doing a lot of research. Because I called him up about my Halloween costume. Oh, yeah. And he says, "Uh, I'm studying right now, man. (laughs) I was like, like, what's up? I'm deep in study right now. I got you at a bad time, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) No, dude, I was like for, that was yesterday, right? I was uh, really, really deep into studying this stuff, and like I felt this pressure of like I've got to get more information, but you know there's only so little time. So yeah, that's that's my bad. But I was I get in these modes where I'm locked in, and I'm like, don't talk to me. Like I need to just be all about this right now. Yeah, I'll lose my train of thought. Like you know. Yeah, lo- lose because it's like you're 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 grasping for something. You're reading texts, and you're 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 looking for like specific angles and information mm-hmm. and you're trying to consume all of it. But you know, the main thing about this is it's also more evergreen because like evergreen meaning like it'll be relevant now, but also in the future, like it's, it's one and done series, uh, you know, per series about these different traditions that forever there'll be great guides and resources and things like that. And you look back through our catalog and we do have episodes where we talked about some of these traditions, but even during them, we've always been like, well, yeah, but maybe in a future episode, we'll go deeper. Right. Always. We've always said that. Yeah. This will be our opportunity to finally go deeper with those and yeah, just like get it all. Yeah. And the evergreen thing is awesome because it's not topical. It's not, you you can listen to this in a thousand years and it's still going to describe the shit that, you know, these wisdom traditions have been about for hundreds and or thousands of years. So before I get into the Essenes, which is the subject of, of this, um, the first wisdom tradition segment, I wanted to talk about, so I was doing my research for this and I found a text. It's a really interesting text by Julie Scott, who is the modern grandmaster of the Rosicrucians. Wow. So the Rosicrucians do publish a lot of their texts online just for like people to read, mm-hmm. you know, cause it's like, from my understanding, the Rosicrucians particularly are more interested in education, mm. like, you know, giving the knowledge. It's like, sure, they do have texts that are secret and you got to be a part of the order to get, but they also provide a lot of, of, uh, of it publicly to sort of entice people and, and, and allow them to like get their feet wet and study the material. Which is really cool. Yeah. I love any kind of thing. You know, it's not gatekeepy. They're not precious about it. You know, it's just like, here it is. Right, Love exactly. That. Love that. Yeah. So this text is titled The Mystery Schools and the Rosicrucian Order, AMORC, which the AMORC is the modern American chapter of the Rosicrucian Order, AMORC meaning the ancient mystic order Rose Crucis. Um, so in this text written by the Grand Master of the Rosicrucians, she gives sort of like a synopsis of the main uh, 
mystery traditions or wisdom traditions of the past that mm. like all these modern esoteric societies are drawing their information from. Cool. So eventually we're going to hit all of these. Um, so we've got dynastic Egypt, which is around 3000 to 30 BC. We've got the Essenes, which is what we're going to focus on today, second century BCE to 100 CE. So they were around the first century. Um, the Atlantis hey. prehistory, prehistory in wow. uh, what's those parentheses? Right. You know, like prehistory, pre dynastic Egypt, the Orphic mysteries, which we have covered before, uh-huh. um, the Delphic mysteries. Ooh. The Pythagorean school, the Mithraic mysteries, which I believe is more Persian, like the modern, or, well, I say modern, we're talking thousands of years ago, <laughs> the later, like, um, evolution of what Zoroastrianism used to be. Um, the mysteries of Eleusis, which is more Grecian mysteries, the Isis mysteries, Hermeticism, Kabbalah, Gnosticism, alchemy, Neoplatonism, Martinism, Rosicrucianism, as it was in the past to modern day, and then the present, the present AMORC, which eventually would we'll just do a whole, you know, Rosicrucian episode. But this is just a sample of like going forward with this segment. Like, there's there's going to be episodes dedicated to dissecting each of these traditions and more. Like, I've already found some really other cool ones that I had never heard of that were like mind blowing. Really? Yeah. Secret like 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 wisdom traditions mm-hmm. you didn't even know about? Oh yeah, there's plenty of them. Damn. See, that's why we needed this segment. Yeah. So that we can, like, dedicate time. It also helps us, too. I think it helps us bring more of, like, a laser-focused vision on the show and, like, what we want it to be. Because it's like, we've always kind of been doing this. Yeah. It's, you know? it's just, yeah, more focused. I, yeah. That's a good way to put it. And that gives us energy to say, okay, well, now Spirit Science, we have a different angle. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love the segment thing. So, so let's get into it. So I want to talk about, for as far as the Essenes... There's a lot of legend about the Essenes, mm-hmm. but the majority of my focus was on the historical fact. Awesome. Like, you know, reading about what's actually known about them, what was actually written about them 2,000 years ago. So oh, the that, legend... That, that stuff is equally as important, I would say, because, you know, it's grounded in reality. You can see the real history. Yeah. Well, what's crazy about that is like when, you know, everything that I read today, like the notes that I've gathered is all of the real history. Wow. And it's honestly like more mind blowing than the legend because it's confirmation. Exactly, bro. Like when I read things about like the real history and life of Jesus rather than like parables and stuff like that, that feels even cooler to me to real like read the real history. Right. I love that. So here's what Julie Scott, the grandmaster of the Rosicrucian order in, in modern times, had to say about the Essenes. The Essenes were mystics who came together in spiritual communities throughout Egypt and Israel. One of these centers was most probably Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Jesus is believed by many to have been a member of the Essene community. Many of their practices paralleled those of the Pythagoreans. Among the different groups of Essenes were the Therapeutae, which we're going to go in depth about today. The Therapeutae near Alexandria, specializing in healing as described by Philo of Alexandria. Health of the body, the soul, and the spirit always figures prominently in the Rosicrucian tradition and its antecedents. So, like, let's, let's, let's analyze that for just a moment. The first level, I believe, just from my experience and everybody around me who's ever come to this knowledge, the first level of finding out about all of this mystery knowledge, these mystery religions. First level is fear. First level is paranoia. There's Illuminati, Freemasons run the world. Oh my God. You know what I mean? It's it's like your first feeling that you get about. Okay. When you understand that there are these groups, the first level is always like, they're bad. They worship the devil. They're anti-Christian. This and that. Dude, you have the, 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 the leader of the whole order sitting here telling you, who, by the way, the leader of a secret society in modern times, it's going to be well-read and well-studied. They have to be. Absolutely. To be, you know, having gone through all the initiations and then by all of the peers at the highest level acknowledged to be the grand master, they have to be somebody who knows their stuff. You know, so like what she's saying about these traditions is, is, is pretty important. And she's telling you right here, it's believed by many that Jesus was one of them. Yeah, isn't there any, isn't there something in the Bible about, because... I, I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but is Essene and like Nazarene? Yeah, that's not in the Bible, but that's the belief. Okay, that's gotcha. where we're I going. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. that the, the Nazarenes were actually the Essenes. So actually, like Essenes have been majority, uh, well, majorly, um, majorly scrubbed from history. 
like there's no single mention of them in the Bible. The only genuine historical references of the Essenes are by uh, Philo of Alexandria, Pliny the Elder, and Flavius Josephus, which were these famous Jewish figures 2,000 years ago. So that's, that's the wow. texts that we're going to focus on, is the writings of these three. Now, there is speculation about the Essenes, and we're going to get into this here too before we get into the actual documents. But the speculation is such that the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found in Qumran, may have been written by the Essenes. There's no oh. proof. There's heavy speculation. I, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's probably true. You know, yeah, just, you, yeah. You know, like all the, we, we covered a lot of this in um, the Metatron episode. Remember the, the, we read from third Enoch, which was part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. Which was found at Qumran. Right. Which was probably written by Essenes. You know, they were mystics. So when we get into the real history, what is an Essene, right? In the first century, meaning like zero to a hundred um, AD, or now they say CE, the common era. In the first century, there were three main types of Jews, religiously, mm -hmm. I, I mean. Mm -hmm. And it was the Pharisees, which are your typical, um, they were like big Torah guys, mm. like, you know, really would preach the Torah and were really into it. Like kind of by the book, Torah following. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, like sort of a priestly class. You had the Sadducees, which, you know, if, if that rings a bell, it's the group of... Um, it's it's the group of people in the Bible who like had Jesus killed. You know, thought, they're okay. the ones yes. who went and like took it to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate and was like, "We need to kill him." It was the Sadducees. They were reported in ancient times to be very barbarous, very vicious, nasty, just like holier than thou. They were the ones who like ran the temple, took money from all the commoners, wouldn't allow mm. them to read the temple scrolls. They were they were your typical like priestly class that's mm. like subjugating the rest of, you know, contemporary Israel gatekeeper. They were like the elite yeah. priestly class. Yeah. Like you can't touch us. Sound, sound like pretty bad guys. Right. Exactly. Bad people. The Essenes. That's the third of the. Yes. Okay. The Essenes were a deeply devout, extremely advanced mystical society. This is historical fact. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Like this is not just legend. This is, mentioned by these ancient writers who actually went firsthand and like observed their community and was taking all these crazy notes about this, 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 this is what they believe. This is what they do. And we're going to dive into that. But um, yeah, it's crazy. So Essene, Pharisee, Sadducees. Now there is a fourth version of Judaism, which is not as well known and they're known as the zealots. Mm. And, you know, around the time of um First century Judea, especially up in around 69 AD, when the great temple of, um, I guess it was in Jerusalem. I'm, I'm not really, it was in Jerusalem, right? I, the, it, the main uh, temple? I the mean, holy temple? Sounds right. Like King Solomon and all that? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know exactly where the temple was. I'm not, you know, but it, it was torn down in around 70 AD by the Romans. It was a huge, mm. terrible, tragic thing. The zealots were a group of Jews who were sort of like radically opposing that movement. They were like extremely just zealous about, you know, the temple and protecting it. And the belief is that they were wiped out. But um, this and, is in 70 CE when the Romans reclaimed Jerusalem and destroyed the second temple. Jerusalem. So it was in there Jerusalem. Yeah. 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 Okay. So getting into the legend. So, I had written this down. The Essenes were a mystic Jewish sect during the second temple period that flourished from the second century BCE, which they changed before Christ and after, you know, right. AD to be before the common era and in the common era, um, to the first century CE contemporaries of their time reported that they were an extremely advanced mystical society. Now here's where we get into the legend. It's believed by many. There's no genuine, historical proof of this, but, you know, it's like we can think out of the box a little bit and examine the evidence. It's believed that Enoch created the Essenes. Oh, wow. It's believed that Enoch is the figure known as Hermes Trismegistus. Mm. It's believed that the Essenes were the first wisdom tradition. Right. Like the first ever. Yeah. You know, it, and it would make sense if Enoch was truly the sage, 
you know, Hermes Trismegistus, who dispensed the knowledge of Atlantis, Enoch would have lived somewhere around five to 7,000 years ago, based on what they believe, mm -hmm. you know? And the Essenes, I mean, they were flourishing, meaning they were at their peak only 2,000 years ago. And it's crazy, because when you read the texts of Pliny, Josephus, and Philo, they're telling you straight up, this order is extremely ancient. The practices that they observe are secret ancient texts that f have existed for thousands of ages. They say that in the text. So it was ancient even 2,000 years ago. A, like More ancient right, than 2,000. Significantly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's historical fact. That's not legend. Right. So that's, that's the crazy part. But, um, okay, so if you, if you look at the very limited number of data available about Enoch in the Bible, he is regarded as the seventh from Adam, which is funny because seven in, in you know, Hebrew culture was the number of perfection. But also even like if you remember our Ageless Wisdom episode, we talk about, I think it's called the, the, um, the Septarian or something like that. It's the concept that like everything is perfected in sevens, the musical scale, the oh. seven classical planets, the rays of light, That's chakras. Septarian. It's the yeah, concept I'm pretty sure. of the yeah. seven. Okay. Yeah. Seven days of the week. Gotcha. You know, God made the earth and then rested on the seventh day. There's all this symbolism behind seven. The seventh letter of the alphabet is G, which could symbolically mean God, which is like the Freemasons. They have the G. It's also seven, you know, so. Oh, shit. Crazy. So Enoch, Enoch is the seventh from Adam, the number of perfection. You look at the um, actual translation from Hebrew or Aramaic to what the name Enoch actually means. Uh, it means founder or initiator. Which, come on now. Yeah. If somebody founded the Essenes, so the timeline is matching up. His name means His the name, initiator. Yeah. It's like... He's also in the Bible even, or it might be the books of Enoch, he's regarded as being the scribe of God. You mm -hmm. know, he went away after 365 days and ascended. And that's, in to, the, that's Genesis. Yeah, and just to like further drive it, you know, with the Hermes Trismegistus stuff, Hermes... Thoth. And Hermes. Thoth. Yeah, the scribe of God. They're scribes. Like, yeah. it's all matching up. And in terms of like, to anybody out there who hears like, there's no concrete historical evidence and that like, you know, makes you feel some type of way. We're talking about potentially 7,000 years ago. Yeah. What would you have expected to survive? You know, right. there are so many right. societies from that long ago that we have nothing to show for. Even, right. Even just physical, scientific, you know, nothing to do with wisdom traditions or spirituality or any of that stuff. We have lost countless things from that long ago. Yeah. Just because we don't have literally like pe like physical evidence of something that was 7,000 years ago, it doesn't mean nothing. This stuff is lining up already. Exactly. So there's something to this shit. There's got to be. That's what there's, I'm there's saying. There's absolutely got to be. Come on now. And, and then, you know, I know I'm going off on a tangent, but when we were talking about Enoch the other day and how the, on the Metatron episode, right? how he's represented, it even says he's represented, he has many names through many cultures. It's like, Come on, man. This, this shit is obviously lining up. So John the Baptist, which, you know, for, for those, I, you know, I, I have to be mindful of the fact that although the Bible is common knowledge to so many people, there are a lot of people who even grew up Christian or Catholic and they have no knowledge of the Bible. You oh, know? So, sure. so like, I feel like some of these things I, I, I want to explain in very simple terms, like John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus in the story. He's the one who baptizes Jesus in the water, right? The story where Jesus gets his first baptism, what is that? He initiates him, mm -hmm. right? John the initiator, John, John, John the Baptist, he baptizes yeah. people, yeah. takes him out into the water, and the story goes, he baptizes his cousin Jesus, and John says something, I, I'm not good with remembering exactly the quotes verbatim, but he says something like, you know, I, I'm not great as the one who comes after me, and he's referencing, you know, his cousin Jesus. But anyway, so we find that I believe that's the first time that baptism was introduced. I don't, I don't think baptism was an ancient Jewish practice. I think it's a more Christian practice. Wow. You see what I'm saying? Now, here's the catch. Remember, I just told you the Essenes were flourishing in the first century BCE, around 100 BCE up to 100, 100 AD. CE. Yeah. Yeah, CE. yeah. So yeah. like before Jesus was even born, we had people writing about these doctrines and practices of the Essenes. And very clearly, we're going to read it very clearly. One of their 
practices was every single morning an Essene initiate would baptize themselves or bathe in cold water. Wow. It's ritual purity. So then, okay, question. According to the Bible, that baptism that John performed on Jesus, are you saying that was like in the Christian canon, the first baptism? If I remember correctly. Wow. Yeah, I, I could be very wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure. And then the, and the fact that the Essenes... Oh, they've been baptizing for thousands of years. Dude. That's my point. Like, there's practices that they had. It's like... There's, there's, there's things in the Christian and, and other religions and other societies that come from them. Yeah, and, and you might even read the Bible and be thinking, like, okay, but where did you, why did you think to do that? Or why, like, when it talks about the, um, what are they called? The, the wise men that are going, mm-hmm. following the star, mm-hmm. why are they doing that? Why are they following the star? You, most people who read the Bible don't think about that. Why did these wise men show up? Well, you know why? Because the, the pre- first, first mention, mention of, of baptism, baptism is John and Jesus. The preaching yeah. of John first ever baptism, wow. right? Yeah. According to the Bible. Right, right. But, you know, the Bible talks about the wise men following the North Star. You do a little bit of digging, and you find out thousands of years before that, it, it was, was prophesied Zoroastrian in text. Zoroastrianism. Yeah. You know, and, and at face value... And reading, it was the Zoroastrian Magi who followed the exactly. star. Exactly. Yeah. There's something going on. Yeah, at face value, you're reading the Bible and thinking, oh, this is the first time all, any of this stuff is happening. Right. But think for a second. Why did, where did they get that from? Right. There well, we, we haven't are. even talked about how John the Baptist and Jesus were Nazarenes. They were from Nazareth. Let's go. I'm getting right? pumped. But the idea here, it, it, it's, there's, there's a... Again, it's like... The Essenes probably were at Qumran. It's like, we, we can't know because we don't have a time machine to go back thousands of years ago. But there's yeah. a lot of evidence that, you know, it's like, it's probably true. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the, the Nazarenes were believed to be the Essenes. Right, right. You know? So it's really crazy. So John the Baptist, no matter how you slice it or dice it, even when you read about him in the Bible with the little bit of canon text about him, mm-hmm. it's like... The way he dresses is distinct. He has like animal fur clothes on with like these leather sandals, something like that. And it's like they make a very subtle reference about him being uh, the second coming of Elijah. Mm. But, you know, if you talk to mystics or, or initiates of any order or like Benjamin Krim, he's a really big uh, theosophy name who, who went out there and was saying this a lot. Um, that anyway, the, the belief is that John the Baptist is the reincarnation of Elijah. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's, there's this undercurrent of these mystical traditions kind of like being connected the whole time throughout human history. And we're only getting these little crumbs when we go to church and read the Bible. Right. See, it's, my, my it, whole thing, it really clicked in my brain, not only when we started seeing the phenomenon and stuff, but when I started reading about Zoroastrianism and the connection there a thousand years before Christ and like the Magi following the star, which they prophesied that would happen and their religion on their turf, mm-hmm. but it linked up with Jesus on his turf. It's like, it started like opening my brain to realize we pull our mind away from the Bible. We pull our mind away from Buddhism or Hinduism or every religion. We pull our mind away from it and we think, God is above all of that. Mm-hmm. You know, they're all just reporting. Yeah, they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to put it in a way that people can understand. And then, unfortunately, some messed up people are adding their own stuff to it, right? To to twist people's minds and stuff. But yeah, you're reading the Bible, and you're you're thinking like, who are these magi that show up and and all this stuff? But in the Bible, you would never see a reference. They would never say explicitly three magi from, you know, the, the order of Zoroaster or whatever. They would never say that because, like you just said, then that pulls you back from the Bible. Yeah. So they would never say it. They just want to give you a tiny little... The three little, kings or the three... Yeah. Magi. I think there was a manuscript a long time ago or some translation that does say magi, but they don't, like, tell you what it is. They right. just say the word and they, they move past. But it's just crazy. So, so we're going to go deeper now. So... The Dead Sea Scrolls, again, they were found in Qumran. There's a belief that they were written by the Essenes. And also, like, it's, it's, indispu- it's indisputable that the Dead Sea Scrolls, whoever wrote them, would have considered them highly secretive. They hid them yeah. around the time of 69 or 70 AD when the temple was being invaded and destroyed by the Romans. Yeah. So that's why in the first place we have all these hidden scrolls that are popping up because mm-hmm. we have these orders that are like, we have to protect these scrolls. We can't let them get burned by these people. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. So... Um, the crazy thing is 
years before 1947. I'm, ta- I'm talking like in real history in the 1940s. Edgar Casey. Do I believe every single thing that Edgar Casey knows? Well, I don't, or said. I don't know everything he said, so no, I don't know. I haven't heard everything he's ever said, but I will say, studying the Edgar Casey material, I believe a lot of it. Mm. It resonates with me. I oh, just, yeah. you know, come to find out, he saw a lady, like a lot of his experiences parallel my dad's, and it, it's just crazy. Like, I, I think there's something to Edgar Casey. He seems like he's in the line of sages. For you, sure. You know? He's definitely a mystic, a sage, whatever. Mm-hmm. And he actually predicted the Dead Sea Scrolls being found like just mere a few years before they were found. But in his reading about this, he, so he did these past life. He, he wasn't like, he wasn't like, um, doing like you hear where people do like hypnosis on people and get information out of them. He was going into a trance and he was for all intents and purposes, like astral projecting or like remote viewing the past. You see what I'm saying? Right. And did he also access the, um, uh, what is it called? Akashic Records. Akashic Records. Yeah. He, yeah. He, okay. He came up with that. Gotcha. He, or he was like the big name that that came from. Right. Okay. Actually, a lot of the new age stuff comes from Edgar Casey. He was way ahead of his time. And the big thing that he said in that reading was that Jesus was a part of the Essenes. Again, we're separating the history from the legend, but we also have this third dimension of this psychic experience that it's like, you know, you could, you could take that as evidence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, if you want. I but mean, yeah. Edgar Casey said in his readings that actually the Essenes were so devoutly mystical that they had a prophecy that there would be someone born unto them that would be a great mystic or uh-huh. a great sage or you know an enlightened being who would awaken other people and it would it would be the vessel of the immortal Christ soul you know because the idea of Christ has existed long before Jesus it's yeah, yeah, it's, it's in Osiris mm-hmm. you know the we just talked about the Irish myth and yeah. there's this these myths all around the world of some solar deity that Atlantean incarnates in myth i mean the majority exactly. of of these wisdom traditions have that Christ consciousness somewhere in them yeah it's just some solar predating, force that predating christianity by thousands of years yeah. yeah so anyway so he had this reading that Jesus was a part of the essenes that they had these scrolls and Qumran and all this stuff and part of his reading too was that John the Baptist was a reincarnation of Elijah and that John the Baptist was a high level initiate of the Essenes and, and all this stuff. So it's, it's just very cool. It's very cool. You could say psychic lore, but yeah, now getting like into, that. now we're going to shift into like the facts. Let's shift. You know what I mean? We're, we're going to get away from legend. We're going to get away from mystics. We're going to start reading some ancient texts. Let's take a shift. <laughs> take a shift right on me. Okay. Yeah. We're going to take a big shift here. So there was this, Around the Maccabean Revolt, which I'm not exactly sure when that was, maybe like 100 or 150 years before Christ, there was this priestly class known as the the um, the sons of Zadok, which Zadok was a figure in the Old Testament who was like considered the high priest of the court of King Solomon. Oh. And supposedly in the story, it's like Zadok will be the one, I think it's like they come from the line of Elijah and like... They um, are the priestly class. You know how you know how Israel is all like super. Like there's twelve tribes: the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of this. There's there's twelve tribes, and they take it very seriously in, oh, yeah, in yeah. biblical text. Yeah. So it was believed that the sons of Zadok were some special mystical lineage of priests. Anyway, it's reported that the Essenes may have also descended from this mystical tribe, giving wow. giving just another layer of some sort of evidence that there was something very significant about them in ancient history. So the sons of Zadok are a family of priests descended from Zadok, described in the prophecies of Ezekiel. Zadok himself was the first high priest in Solomon's temple in the 10th century BCE. Um, his descendants were high priests in that temple until its destruction in 587 BCE. Because, you know, the temple's been destroyed twice. Wow. Ezekiel's prophecy came several decades after that destruction and describes the Zadokite family's loyalty to God while the rest of the nation rebelled against God. The sons of Zadok are mentioned four times in the Hebrew Bible as a part of the third temple prophecies in the final chapters of the book of Ezekiel and are a theme of Jewish and Christian interpretation of these chapters. Various documents of the text found at Qumran, which are the Dead Sea Scrolls, mention the teachers of the community as Kohanim sons of Zadok, which Kohanim is Hebrew for priests. Um, leading some scholars to assume that the Essenes from Qumran 
included priests who refused to participate in the Hellenization of the priesthood taking place in Jerusalem. So the Greeks and the Romans, and they were coming in and they were like trying to morph it. Yeah, morph it. it. Exactly. Make them exactly. erecting statues of Zupi Jupiter and yeah. Zeus and all that. And, you know, anyway, so very, very cool. So Essenes here is, uh, let me see which one this is from. In regard to the origin of the Essenes, neither Josephus nor Philo can give a specific date, but both make clear that the Essenian roots are incredibly ancient. Josephus declares, again, this is from his words from his text, that the Essenes have existed from time immemorial mm. and countless generations, while Philo of Alexandria agrees, calling the Essenes the most ancient of all the initiates, with a teaching perpetuated through an immense space of ages. Josephus and Philo, as well as several other ancient writers, including Pliny the Elder, are in consensus on two points regarding the origin of the Essenes. Pliny is P-L-I-N-I? Why? Oh, okay. There's a band called Pliny, and they're dope. Sorry. Oh, nice. Sorry. Nice. <laughs> yeah. They, they are in consensus on two points. The origin is lost in prehistory with certain, certain ancient legends linking them with Enoch, and there was a major... Manifestation of the Essenes by Moses at Mount Sinai. Mm. So it's believed that when Moses came and he had his whole Ten Commandment shtick and he went up and he saw God on the mountain, that the Essenes would have had a major revival. You know, it's like Mo after that, during that, oh, like Mo it's it's okay. the Essenes revered Moses as their greatest uh, prophet. Remember, Jesus went around yet, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess Enoch was. Well, there's another, I have a speculation on why they didn't reference Enoch, because actually we find in their doctrines that they were very secretive about their texts. Mm. They never divulged their text or the names of their angels to outsiders, only to initiates. Oh, they, so they, that would kind of lend itself to the reason they don't mention Enoch. Yeah, there's actually no surviving texts of the Essenes. Like, the only, the only thing we have about them, which we're about to dive into, are what ancient historians and philosophers wrote about them. Yeah. There, there's no texts about them. There's, there's wow. nothing. Uh, that's tragic. They were wiped out of history. They're not mentioned in the Bible. The only, the only evidence we have are like four documents and texts that were found in the desert in the 1940s and 50s that are speculated to be about them. Now, I might be really jumping ahead here, but I mean, did uh, Kabbalah, does that have anything to do with the Essene? Did it, it does. I, I thought like... Absolutely it does. Okay. Like, Kabbalah it, is esoteric Judaism. Right, it's sounding pretty similar so far. I didn't know if like Kabbalah like came from this. Th this I don't know for this. certain if it came from it, but there's there's some sort of the knowledge would be mingled. Right, because I'm hearing like mystic Judaism. Right, Essenes in Israel or in Jerusalem or around that same area. We're talking about very similar. There's a lot of overlap here. Yeah. So it's just piquing my curiosity. No, there is an overlap. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. That is kind of fascinating. It almost makes you wonder, like, maybe maybe some of this stuff survived. Maybe it just changed a little bit so that it could survive. True. Yeah, that's a great point. It's just, yeah. So, okay. So before, so Pliny the Elder wrote very little about the Essenes, but Josephus, or Flavius Josephus, is the most famous um, Jewish historian of all time. He wrote, he lived around the time of Jesus and wrote a lot about contemporary stuff back then, you know, like 2000 years ago. He's a very prominent figure that everybody studies when they study religion at some sort of college level. Gotcha. And then the other one is Philo of Alexandria. Mm. He is probably the most famous Jewish philosopher. It's cool, actually. I thought I was thinking of you when I was reading his text because he writes a lot about like Plato, Pythagoras. Because well, they... he sounds Greek. Philo of Alexandria. I'm pretty sure he's Jewish, but he speaks Greek. Okay. He he lived in Alexandria, Egypt. He could be Greek, but because I... I mean, I eat philo dough all the time. I would so... I would feel so dumb if he was Greek <laughs> and the whole also time. Alexandria, like well, he lived in Alexandria, right? Egypt. Yeah. So then he could. I mean, who knows? Who, you know who who? Knows? But it sounds it, it sounds kind of Greek. Um. Is it? He was a Hellenistic Jewish philosopher. So he, oh, he was. Oh, so he was double dipping. Yeah. He, he was double dipping. <laughs> okay. He was born in 25 BC. That's kind of tight. Damn. So he would have been alive when Jesus was around. I'm pretty sure he wrote about him. So anyway, so this is from Pliny the Elder of, on natural history, which was written somewhere around the first through the, th the third century. So somewhere from zero to 200 AD. Lying on the west side of the asphalt lake and sufficiently distant to escape its noxious fumes are the Essenes. This is a descent group 
that lives apart from the world and that is amazing beyond all others throughout the whole world. Whoa. They have no women among them. Now, I want to note. Lame. I want to note. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting. There's two versions of the Essenes. One of them didn't have any women. One of them, the women were the priests. Okay. So it's like there's a split there. I was, I was, it's important to mention that. But um, this is a descent group that lives apart from the world. They have no women among them. They are strangers to sexual desire. They have no money. They only have palm trees as companions. Day after day, however, their numbers are fully recruited by numerous strangers that come to them, driven there by storms of fortune to adopt their way of life and tired from the miseries of life. And this way, through thousands of ages, incredible to relate, this descent group sustains its existence forever without a single birth placing the, uh, taking place there. The wariness of others' lives is a very fruitful source of its population. So, they sound like monks. They absolutely were. That's what I'm saying. That, they, were, <laughs> they were ascetic mystics. Who we're, we're going we're gonna to get into that. But, Whoa. But, but note here that Pliny, 2,000 years ago, just said it's incredible to relate that they have sustained their existence forever through countless thousands of ages, he said. Thousands of ages without a single birth taking place. So, again, there was a split. There was Essenes that were celibate. Mm. They were purely ascetic. It's not that they like hated women and judged them, but that they lived a life devoted to being constantly, you know, in the spirit. Like they were completely it's like, like monks. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why you, with, they were monks. Like Tibetan monks, you don't see women Tibetan monks. Or or, monks. or uh, um like like Catholic monasteries. Uh, yeah. Like nuns and priests. Right, I'm right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But um uh, yeah, so they didn't have children. They, they recruited people who were suffering. They, mm. they would go out, and anybody that came to them, if they were sick, if they were elderly, if they were poor, they would take them in. They would feed them and treat their wounds and their sickness, and, and they would allow anybody to approach and um, try to join their order. But they had an extremely strict initiation process, which went on for several years. They had to like prove that they were worthy and go for long periods of time without even speaking. And Sorry, it sounds like the... Um uh, in Game of Thrones, when Sam goes to the library, yes, yes, yeah, the great library, yeah, yeah because all, all they were the... taking in all the sick people, yeah, and uh, I wonder if that's kind of tied in, and also all the priests and um, stuff from Game of Thrones, like very similar to Catholicism. They're all supposed to be, they're supposed to be celibate. They're all supposed to like stave off desire and all it, it is. Yeah. That's a good point. That's, that's very similar. Yeah. And again, there was another group of Essenes who did take wives, right? You know, because they believed, well, this is, this is a part of creation. Like we're, we, you know, the human race won't survive unless we use our magical divine powers to create life and propel the human race. So th it's funny how they were complete opposite. Sure. Yeah. Celibate, but like, no, we're having kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like that a little better, All Right. but, um, yeah, and it's also important to note that, like, we're going to dive deeper here in, into their beliefs, and I just want to say, like, these are beliefs and practices that are so extreme and so strict that I don't think, the only way you could do this in modern society is if you went off and were a monk, and you, right. you know, like, the, we're going to get into their doctrine now. I looked into that. What? Being, being a monk? Yeah. Yeah, well, you look into all kinds of stuff. Well, they, <laughs> they, it's a um, two-month retreat. And you go to uh, Thailand. So you just like play pretend for a couple months. Yeah, no, seriously. You just want to walk up and down the red light district. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was actually, I just want one of those cool robes. Yeah. But I want to earn it. You know, you, shave you your head. It. They shave your eyebrows. Uh, like you, you get there, you check in all your money, your phone, everything. They put it away and you like live by the rules. The only rule, and I read the rules, um, you can't eat standing up. Hmm. See, I find that offensive. Yeah, I love eating standing up. <laughs> you too. Well, uh, yeah. They say you have to enjoy what you're eating. I you have to the like. Show of it. <laughs> I love standing up and eating. I'll eat right over the trash can, so that whatever's <laughs> left, I can just fucking drop it and I'm done. Yeah. And Casey gets so mad at me. <laughs> Why are you standing eating? It's, you also. Um, it's quicker. It's quicker. <laughs> you can't. You can't sleep in a high place, which. I thought about it a lot. I, it, I think it just means bed. Like you have to sleep on the ground. Oh yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. <laughs> so, so those are the only two r rules I remember. I didn't do it, but obviously I didn't do it. But because 
podcast and I have to take a pause. Right. Yeah. Good excuse. Yeah. There was a while where he was genuinely talking about like, I think I want to do this. I think I want to do this. In my head, I'm like, you're never going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But no, that that is really cool. But yeah, I just wanted to say like, it, it's obvious that we don't share all of these <laughs> Opinions, uh, yeah. it, it, you know, because because right. some of them, it's like it's it's pretty extreme, but it's 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 fascinating. It's fascinating to see these traditions that have existed in in the ancient past that up until now we knew zero about. Mm. We meaning like anybody who's never heard of this, yeah, because you're not commonly taught this. And also, it's like, dude, I'm 30 years old, and I'm just now finding out a lot about this stuff because I was like, you know what, I want to do an episode on it and break it down and like consume everything I can about it. Why isn't this the kind of stuff? This is the kind of stuff that should be taught in school. It's like, it's funny because in school, it's like, you're not allowed to talk religion. You're not allowed to talk about the Bible or, or, Mm -hmm. you know, certain things, but like in reality, they should talk about all of them. They should. I feel like we should be educated on all of them. Absolutely. It's rich culture. If nothing else, Yeah. if nothing else, exactly. Don't teach me how to do the fucking Pythagorean theorem. Teach me about Pythagoras. Right. Like, teach me what he was thinking about spirituality. and the, or both. The, or What do I need the Pythagorean theorem for, bro? A squared plus B squared? I don't ever be with A's and B's and all that. That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't yeah. need that. Just yeah. Teach me about the It dude. is kind of lame, right? We only learn about Pythagorean theorem, but there's so much more to the dude that's beyond Pyth- oh, yeah. a like, little geometry it, equation. And it's infinitely cooler. Yeah. Like, dude, only teach me that if I'm trying to be, like, a mathematician or something that involves heavy math. Otherwise, bro, get that out of here. <laughs> so now we're going to get into the doctrine. Yeah. This is an excerpt from Philo of Alexandria on the Therapeutae, which was the Egyptian sect of the Essenes that lived near um, Alexandria, Egypt. And in every house, there is a sacred shrine, which is called the holy place in the monastery in which they retire by themselves and perform all the mysteries of a holy life, bringing in nothing, neither meat nor drink nor anything else, which is indispensable towards supplying the necessities of the body, but studying in that place, the laws and the sacred oracles of God enunciated by the holy prophets and hymns and Psalms and all kinds of other things by reason of which knowledge and piety are increased and brought to perfection. Therefore, they always retain an imperishable recollection of God, so that not even in their dreams is any other object ever presented to their eyes except the beauty of the divine virtues and of the divine powers. Therefore, many persons speak in their sleep, divulging and publishing the celebrated doctrines of the sacred philosophy. And they are accustomed to pray twice every day, at morning and at evening, when the sun is rising, retreating God, entreating God, that the happiness of the coming day may be real happiness so that their minds may be filled with heavenly light. And when the sun is setting, they pray that their soul, being entirely lightened and relieved of the burden of the outward senses and of the appropriate object of these outward senses, may be able to trace out truth existing in its own consistory and council chamber. And the interval between morning and evening is by them devoted wholly to meditation Bro, let's go. Uh, meditation. Yeah. What's that sound like? That sound like China. Yeah. Tibet, India, Persia, the Middle East. They they're not talking about meditation. Yeah. In the Bible. No way. That's mystical. That's I mean. Right. I mean, I, throughout our lives, we've heard people that say that stuff's evil. That was written two thousand years ago. Right. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like they. We're gonna keep going. Okay. <laughs> that that right there blew my mind. Keep you know? spitting. Keep spitting. Yeah. Uh, let me find where I was. Meditation. And the interval between morning and evening is by them devoted wholly to meditation on and practice of virtue, for they take up the sacred scriptures and philosophize concerning them. Oh shit. <laughs> investigating. Listen to this. This is very important. Investigating the allegories of their national philosophy, since they look upon their literal expressions as symbols of some secret meaning of nature intended to be conveyed in those figurative expressions. Yo. They practiced esoteric arts. They had symbolism uh, concealing the true mystery of the divine and consciousness. 
Again, this was written 2,000 years ago. That's unbelievable. That's the kind of man. stuff that you're reading in Mason Lodges and Rosicrucian and stuff now. Today. This was written by Philo of Alexandria about them 2,000 years ago. He's talking about like perceiving your reality symbolically. Yeah, and figuratively and allegorically. Thousands of years ago. That's what ago. I'm saying. There's something going on with this mystical stuff in history that like is hidden from us. Like, Why doesn't everybody know about this stuff? Yeah, I know. We all go to church or whatever practice we have, but it's like, this is like, huh? Yeah, because you know what's wild? Like, exoteric religion, what's it all focused about? It's all focused about after this life. It's all focused about what comes next. Right. What you can do now to earn what comes next or whatever. These mystery traditions, these wisdom traditions are telling you how to try and seek and understand or perceive your reality now for how truly mystical it is to change your life in this realm. Right. It's like, I can't believe that was written uh, I guess, years I guess ago. even, there's a lot more. I, I'm going to start cook. I'm going to start cook. kicking it up. Let him cook. Yeah. Let him cook. I'm going to start kicking in the gear and start cooking it up. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's the very next line. They also have writings of ancient men who having been the founders of one sect or another have left behind them many memorials of allegorical system of writing and explanation whom they take as a kind of model and imitate the general fashion of their sect so that they do not occupy themselves solely in contemplation, but they likewise compose psalms and hymns to God in every kind of meter and melody imaginable, which they of necessity arrange in more dignified rhythm. Therefore, during six days, meaning like of the week, you know, because they observed the Sabbath. Mm. Therefore, during six days, each, each of these individuals retiring into solitude by himself. Remember, they didn't marry and have children, right? Right, right. They, they were ascetic. Marrying into solitude by themselves, or excuse me, retiring into solitude, philosophizes by himself in one of the places called monasteries, never going outside the threshold of the outer court and never indeed even looking out but on the seventh day they all come together is at the meet in a sacred assembly and they sit down in order according to their ages with all becoming gravity keeping their hands inside their garments having their right hand between their chest and their dress and the left hand down on their side close to their flank and then the eldest of them who has the most profound learning in their doctrines comes forward and speaks with a steadfast look and with a steadfast voice with great powers of reasoning and great prudence and making an exhibition of his oratorical powers like the rhetoricians of old or the sophists of the present day but investigating with great pains and explaining with minute accuracy the precise meaning of the laws, which sits not indeed at the tips of their ears, but permeates through their hearing into the soul and remains there lastingly. And all the rest listen in silence to the praises which he bestows upon the law, showing their assent only by nods of the head or the eager look of the eyes. And this common holy place which they all come together on the seventh day is a twofold circuit being separated partly into the apartment of the men and partly into a chamber for the women. Remember, this is the Egyptian chapter, the third right, pute. Right. A chapter for women also in accordance with the usual fashion here form a part of the audience having the same feelings of admiration as the men and having adopted the same sect with equal deliberation and decision and the wall which is between the houses rises from the ground three or four cubits upward and and uh uh yeah that's just describing the rest is not important so they were recognized moving on to the next text text they were recognized by contemporaries of the time as being the most advanced and ancient initiatory society. This is written by Philo of Alexandria in his text on the contemplative life. This is then what I have to say of those who are called the therapeutae, who have devoted themselves to the contemplation of nature and who have lived in it and in the soul alone, being citizens of heaven and of the world, very acceptable to the father and creator of the universe because of their virtue, which has procured them his love as their most appropriate reward, for which far surpasses all the gifts of fortune and conducts them to, conducts them to the very summit and perfection of happiness. So again, like analyzing that, we're talking about very famous historians and philosophers that we're still talking about thousands of years later, went and observed these societies, and they reported, they're the happiest people I've ever met. They have the most advanced spiritual shit going on out of any culture I've ever seen. They have thousands, they estimate, Pliny the Elder estimates, they probably had 4,000 in their order that were all living communally, sharing all their possessions. They had no money. They aggressively rejected materialism, and they were just all happy singing songs together and praise, fasting, and meditating, and like they were an extremely advanced spiritual society who had rituals or, or rather symbols 
and, and, you know, allegories. And they had these secret ways that, that it says that they learned from ancient sages yeah. that they explain the mysteries of God through symbols. Bruh, the Bible doesn't say any of that. No, none of it. And, and it's closely related to the shit that they talk about in the Bible. Like, why are we skipping out on all that? That's crazy. They were literally like, like monks. We're talking about a commune. We're talking about fasting, meditation, anti-materialism. Like, they even took baths in cold water. Like, yeah, every <laughs> they're morning. doing a cold plunge. Yeah, like, every day. You know, like, wow. How did the Bible just fully gloss over all that? Well, they were wiped out from it. Yeah, I know. It that, makes you wonder, why is there nothing it, except for this about these people? It does make you wonder. Really? It's it, it, And you have all these other psychic people, if you believe that or not, it doesn't matter. You have all these other psychic people in modern times getting all these hits independently of each other. Jesus and John the Baptist were Essenes. The Nazarenes were Essenes. Blah, blah, blah. The Essenes, Essenes. You have all this stuff, you know? And it's like, then you read the real historical stuff about them, and it's like, damn. And, and we hadn't even talked about the crystals yet. Crystals? Now, now we're actually getting into the doctrine. You ready? Let's go, let's go. They worshiped the one true God as light. Mm. They worshiped the light. They were, they were like the sons of the light. The, they had ritual initiations, plus obviously secrecy surrounding the sacred angels, rites, and texts. That was written in Josephus, War of the Jews 2. They, they very carefully guarded the name of their holy angels and, and all of it. Mm. They did not divulge the mysteries to outsiders. They just ate with them, gave them clothes and food and medicine if they were sick and poor, and they would laugh with strangers and treat them like family, but they wouldn't reveal the mysteries. Mm. They had to earn it. Yeah. But now, this is from the text, War of the Jews 2. But now, if anyone hath a mind to come over to their sect, he is not immediately admitted, but he has prescribed the same method of living which they use for a year, while he continues excluded. And they give him a small hatchet and the forementioned girdle in the white garment. They only wore white garments because mm. it was pure. And when he hath given evidence during that time, he can observe their continence. He approaches nearer to their way of living and is made a partaker of the waters of pur purification. Yet he is not even now admitted to live with them. For after this demonstration of his fortitude, his temper is tried two more years. And if he appears to be worthy, then they admit him into their society. And before he is allowed to touch their common food, he is obliged to take tremendous oaths that in the first place he will exercise piety towards God and that he will observe justice towards men and that he will do no harm to anyone, either of his own accord or by the command of others, that he will always hate the wicked and be the assistant to the righteous. He will ever show fidelity like loyalty right. to all men and especially to those in authority because no one obtains the government without God's assistance. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> and that if he be an authority, he will at no time whatever abuse his authority nor endeavor to outshine his subjects either in his garments or any other finery, and that he will perpetually be a lover of truth and propose to himself to reprove those that tell lies, that he will keep his hands clear from theft, his soul from unlawful gains. He will never conceal anything from those of his own sect nor discovery of their doctrines to others. Like, you don't reveal the mystery. Sure, yeah. Um, no, not through, though anyone should compel him to do so at the hazard of his life. Moreover, he swears to communicate their doctrines to no one otherwise than as he received them himself, that he will abstain from robbery, robbery and will equally preserve the books belonging to their sect. I want to know what these books are. I, know, I want these books. <laughs> he will preserve the books belonging to their sect and the names of the angels or messengers. These are the oaths by which they secure their proselytes to themselves. They teach an ancient exoter uh, esoteric and symbolic allegory. I think I already read this one, though. And these explanations of the sacred scriptures. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This right here. Again, it, it is a, it's another part written 2,000 years ago. Mm. Okay. He says, and these explanations of the sacred scriptures are delivered by mystic expressions and allegories. Mm. For the whole of the law appears to these men to resemble a living animal, and its Whoa. expressed commandments seem to be the body and the invisible meaning concealed under and lying beneath the plain words resembles the soul in which the rational soul begins most excellently to contemplate what belongs to itself as in a mirror, beholding in these very words the exceeding beauty of the sentiments and unfolding of 
the explaining of the symbols and bringing the secret meaning naked to the light to all who are able by the light of a slight intimation to perceive what is unseen by what is visible. So they had layers of secrecy regarding their doctrine. Wow, man. You don't hear people speak this eloquently on spirituality. This was 2000 years ago. That's this is I'm just impressed with the eloquence because the way that this is being phrased, it's hitting. I don't even have to think about it. It's right there. It's going into my brain and immediately being absorbed. That's so eloquent. Yeah. I haven't. I, yeah, I'm kind of pissed now because I'm. I want to read these books. Yeah, what are these books? Yo, I want man. their books. Wow, that is really blowing my mind. When they're uh, continuing the next line, when therefore the president appears to have spoken at sufficient length and to have carried out his intentions adequately, so that his explanation has gone on felicitously and fluently through his own acuteness, and the hearing of the others has been profitable, applause arises from all of them, as men rejoicing together at what they have seen and heard. And someone rising up sings a hymn which has been made in honor of God, either such as he has composed himself or some ancient one of some old poet, for they have left behind the many poems and songs and trimeter iambics, whatever that is, and in psalms of thanksgiving. Iambic is like, I believe it's like a structure of poetry or hymn or something. Iambic pentameter. Right, exactly, yeah. Nice. But this says trimeter. Trimeter. It's another. Right, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so they all sing. Okay. Sounds like church. (laughs) <laughs> this this is this is the best part. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Right. Um, I think that's where church came from. That's what I'm saying. It's from them. Where where did they get that ritual? Let's all sing after it's, the uh, sermon. Yeah, and get together once yeah. a week. Trimeter is one type of meter used in poetry in which each line has three metrical feet. Right, right, right. Nice. I don't this know what is, that means, though. This is my favorite, and quite frankly, I think this is the most mind blowing of all of it. Oh, let's go. So this was in The Wars of the Jews 2 by Flavius Josephus. You ready? Uh-huh. Alex, you ready? Get your angel ears open. Yeah. <laughs> you ready? I'm ready, bro. They also take great pains in studying the writings of the ancients and choose out of them what is most for the advantage of their soul and body. And they inquire after such roots and medicinal stones as may cure their distempers. <laughs> Dude, dude, see, <laughs> the crystals. They were using herbs and crystals to heal diseases and spiritual maladies. And not only that, yes, that, that alone is incredible. And, you know, but the thing that is so beautiful about that passage, you sent me that, you sent me yeah. that the other day, and I was... Just a little tease. It is such a warm sentiment, and it's so refreshing to know that true mystics thousands of years ago with the only, with only the urge to understand the universe that they live in and nothing more were wise enough to know that you can pull value from all wisdom traditions, from all religions, all, and and you can leave the things that don't serve you. That's what they do now. You know, mystics. Yeah. Yes. That's what it's like. That's what I'm saying. They did it then. It's crazy. Thousands of years ago. Yeah. It's insane. But uh, it, that is just, it's so beautiful. I've said that on this show before. Right. Take the things that serve you and leave the things that don't. That is true spirituality. Hot take. You're hearing it here on blood. So said so (laughs) that is spirituality. Spirituality isn't following one little thing and staying in that box. Well, I mean, I'm, I can't. That's a blanket statement. I don't want to. Because some things are right. objectively true. Keep going. True. Keep you're going. Right, you're right. Some things are objectively true. But like, take the stuff. But, that- but, but here's the point of that. They're, they're using what, what actually works. Exactly. You see what I'm saying? Because they're not tied to a specific, like, it, here's our religion. Like, no, no. no. Like spiritual proof. This is, yeah, exactly. This is the stuff that has worked since the time of the ancients. Let's write it down and incorporate it. Yeah. You and wanna, keep moving. Exactly. Like spiritual flexibility. Dude. Well, dude, it's exactly what esoteric occult science is. It's exactly what the Rosicru- you, you start reading the text of the Rosicrucians. You start reading the modern like reformation of the Gnostic movement that has their own, you know, uh, I don't know what you call it, like programs where you can read the beliefs of Gnostics. They say it f- plainly. They're like, we are pulling from the Persians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Essenes. I, I read you the text. She's like, this is what we're pulling from. 
What oh. what we in modern times we're learning from these traditions because meditation works, chakras are real, crystals are real. Uh, okay, so the Persians had this star system. We like that. They're, they're they're taking these ancient traditions that that have real evidence of working, and they're synthesizing it into this 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 mystical practice. You know what I mean? It's it's the opposite of religion. It is, it's, man. You know, it's it's just existing in truth. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. It's it's funny because you throw on around the word like spirituality and it, it, there's so many different perceptions to that. But to me, that that is true because you are doing anything necessary to understand the spirit. Right. You're 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 grasping at everything that works, everything that makes sense, everything that clicks, leave everything that doesn't work. You're focusing solely on spirit. That's spirituality. Right. That's beautiful, dude. I'm probably, I'm not going to read all of the texts because I actually have a lot more than I've already read, but I'm, I'm going to get through the good ones. Okay. So I, I'm going to summarize their doctrine, but know that the next few things that I'm about to say, all of these come from either on the Contemplative Life by Philo of Alexandria, or they come from the War of the Jews 2 by Josephus, which again, these were both texts that were written thousands of years ago, and there's even more texts that write about them by Josephus. Um, Philo and Pliny the Elder. I'm not even sure if I'm um, reading much more from Pliny the Elder. They fasted during the day. They only ate at night because they believed that to eat during the light of the day when the sun is present, which is supposed to be symbolic of like, you know, God, the, the great spirit, they didn't want to feed their body because they were so extreme about only existing in the spirit. They were trying to be mm. as close to spirit as possible. So they would fast during the day. They wouldn't speak before sunrise. They didn't want to waste their breath and their mental capacities talking about random mundane things before the sun was up. They would only eat at night. A lot of them were so extreme that they would fast for three days, or the really extreme ones would fast for six days and only ever eat on the Sabbath. So, so they one day a week. Some of them, yeah. Not all of them. Wow. This is what they said. They were like the more extreme of them would only eat on the Sabbath ever. Wow. And they, they I'm telling you, dude, like they completely rejected any notion or idea of like physical pleasure. Like, bro, most of them would only be eating like the most minutely salted bread. Right. Because they're like, I don't want. Just whatever Delicious to food. sustain. Yeah. Just keep your body alive and, yep. yeah, and yeah. 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 They they were like that. They were so seriously focused on at every present moment trying to 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 be connected with God. Right. You know what I mean? They're simply eating to live. Right. They're not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, the whole order. Again, they, most of them probably would be eaten at night, but the more extreme. <laughs> sure. You ever yeah. think like what would happen if you if you went back in time and plucked one of these people out and took them to like a IMAX. McDonald's, <laughs> no, like an IMAX movie theater, and just or maybe that new Las Vegas Sphere. Oh yeah! Oh god, dude! <laughs> they'd be like, they'd, yeah. they'd, <laughs> they'd be like freaking out. In half. <laughs> yeah, like just die on the spot. Yeah, they would freak out. Yeah, they communally shared all of their possessions. They didn't receive like an income, any sort of labor they did that had any sort of money or any sort of payment or reward. They immediately would bring it to the order, and the order had like a public inventory of all food, all possessions, all money, and they shared it 100% freely between everybody. That's amazing. And they thrived. They actually were so ascetic, meaning they're like separated from society. They had communal agrarian style villages, and it was reported by these writers that their houses were so basic that it looked like they were thrown up in a rush. They had the coarsest, cheapest rugs. They only wore the plainest white garments, white clothes, white shoes, and it was a part of their doctrine that they would never even get a new robe until the one they were wearing was so dilapidated and worn down that it was breaking apart. Because they were <laughs> so much like no nice clothes, no nice shoes. That stuff doesn't matter. It, none of it matters. We reject it. We're on, They were like a hundred percent literally away from society outside of the major cities in their own little contained monastic villages doing it it's like a commune honestly yeah. it's a, a, commune. a commune where their express purpose is to try to live solely as a soul right not a person exactly that's beautiful and it was reported too that they loved doing labor and giving all of their possessions and income to the commune why wouldn't you because it's it gonna brought literally, them joy and they were happy it's gonna literally benefit you and everyone else around you to do that why wouldn't they i mean 
that's just beautiful. That's interesting to me, though, because like I feel like a lot of people, the allure of that lifestyle for a lot of people is to not have to work. But then you put yourself in that place and you find that like humans naturally like to work. Well, absolutely. The I think, in my opinion, this is a little bit of a tangent. I think the people don't the, the reason people don't like to work today is because they don't like their job. Well, yeah, because they really don't get much there's of no, anything for doing it. There's also no purpose to, you know, it's like back then, you know, we're talking ancient times. It's like, I'm the blacksmith. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm the shipwright. Right. Now it's like, I, I work for some company. Yeah. Nine to five. And, and they give me a little paycheck. Yeah. And that's it. But, but this work that these people were doing is, is making the whole commune survive. Right. It's benefiting every single person in that commune. If that was the the sort of society or if that's how I was living, I would love to work all the time because it's just benefiting everyone around you and everyone is working together for each other. Right. That's beautiful. It sounds pretty awesome. It does. (laughs) They uh, observed extreme ritual purity and chastity. So again, like the the section that was not in Alexandria, Egypt, known as the Therapeutae, that's the Greek word, but they they were Essenes. They were like another branch of Essenes. The ones that lived in Israel, um, they they were celibate, like their whole lives. It was only men. And they, yeah, they would would do the cold water bathing every morning. And um, they had extreme honor and adoration for the elder initiates and actually the elder initiates were reported to be very lighthearted, very carefree, almost like children. Oh. They're so happy and oh. so and they would laugh and they would they would just smile and you know the the old guys are just as funny as the young guys and they were all like one, you know, they all respected each other as one. But in their ceremonies on the Sabbath day, the the elders would speak, right. you know, because they had the most wisdom. So, very cool there. Um, let me skip through. We don't need to read the text on that though. Um, cause it's very long. They aggressively shunned material desires and keep only plain possessions out of necessity for survival. And it says here from Philo in on the contemplative life and the order in which they sit down to meet is a divided one. The men sitting on the right hand and the women, the women apart from them on the left. And in case anyone by chance suspects that cushions, if not very costly ones, still at all events of a tolerably Soft substance. <laughs> Again, we're talking about their furniture's cheap. <laughs> of a soft, a tolerably soft substance, <laughs> are prepared for men who are well born and bred. Okay. The healthy guys get the tolerably get the, soft cushions, yeah. you know. And contemplators of philosophy, he know he must know that they have nothing but rugs of the coarsest materials. <laughs> <laughs> cheap mats of the most ordinary kind of papyrus of the land, piled up on the ground and projecting a little near the elbow so that the feasters may lean upon them, for they relax in a slight degree the Lacedaemonian rigor of life. And at all times and all places they practice a liberal, gentleman-like kind of frugality, hating the allurements of pleasure with all their might. <laughs> wow, that's The coarsest, intense. cheapest rugs. Yeah, <laughs> the healthy young men, they get the, the tolerable cushion. <laughs> the t- the, the, I love the fact that it says tolerable. It's tolerable. It's enough. Meaning that everything else is intolerable. Like everything else is terrible. Oh, I, I read this from the earlier passage talking about like the ritual purity and chastity. And the women also share in this feast, the greater part of whom, though old, are virgins in respect of their purity, not indeed through necessity, as some of the priestesses among the Greeks are who have been compelled to preserve their chastity more than they would have done of their own accord, but out of an admiration for and love of wisdom with which they are desirous to pass their lives on account of which they are indifferent to the pleasures of the body, desiring not a mortal but an immortal offspring, which the soul that is attached to God is alone able to produce by itself and from itself, the Father having sown it into rays of light, appreciable only by the intellect, by means of which it will be able to perceive the doctrines of wisdom. Bro, we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about doctrines of wisdom coming from immortal rays of light. Yeah. That sounds like theosophy. Yeah. Or like or, or Rosicrucianism or, or I mean, dude, it's like this was written two thousand years ago. I, I, I keep saying that because it keeps blowing my this mind. This is written two thousand years ago about a society that existed five thousand years before that. At least. At, oh, yeah, at least, because he, they, he also, one of them also said thousands of ages. Right. 
Like, so who knows? One of them said time immemorial. Right, right. The yeah. most ancient of all orders. Yeah. Like, bro, what is going on here? Like, and, and the current secret societies and wisdom traditions are talking about the same stuff. Exactly the same stuff, dude. No, they're, they're talking this about is, them. These are the <laughs> real OG. That's what I'm saying, man. Like, I, I really believe the Enoch stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, It's yeah, hard yeah. to deny. No, it is. When you get in there and you start doing some cross-referencing... It it all lines up. It makes sense. It lines up exactly. That's why I'm like, just because it doesn't, there's not like physical proof, whatever. Just come on, read between the lines, uh, overlap. Like that stuff happens. It's right? crazy, that bro. Like happened. we all seen Scooby Doo. You know, you just put the pieces together, and it makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> I'm serious. There's a couple more main points here. They had the strict belief that the soul is immortal. This is from the Wars of the Jews 2 by Flavius Josephus. For their doctrine is this, that bodies are corruptible and that the matter they are made of is not permanent, but that the souls are immortal and continue forever and that they come out of the most subtle air and are united to their bodies as to prisons. What that sound like? Wow. Gnosticism. Wow. Right? This is the prison realm or it's the allegory of hell, right? Mm -hmm. That they are united to their bodies as to prisons into which they are drawn by a natural, a certain natural enticement, but that when they are set free from the bonds of the flesh, they then as released from a long bondage rejoice and mount upwards. Mm. What's that sound like? Hermeticism. It's the idea that the souls are constantly incarnating upwards on this, the path of evolution. They mount upward when they're freed from the flesh. Um, and this is like the opinions of the Greeks, that good souls have their habitations beyond the ocean in a region that is neither oppressed with storms of rain or snow or with intense heat, but that this place is such as refreshed by the gentle breathing of a west wind that is perpetually blowing from the ocean, while they allot to bad souls a dark and tempestuous den full of never-ceasing punishments. Mm. And indeed, the Greeks seem to me to have followed the same notion when they allot the islands of the blessed to their brave men whom they call heroes and demigods and to the souls of the wicked the region of the ungodly in Hades, where their fables relate to certain persons such as Sisyphus and Tantalus and Ixion and Titus are punished, which is built on this first supposition that souls are immortal, and thence are those exhortations to virtue and dehortations from wickedness collected, whereby good men are bettered in the conduct of their life and the hope they have of reward after their death, and whereby the vehement inclinations of bad men to vice are restrained by the fear and expectation that they are in, and although they should lie concealed in this life, they should suffer immortal punishment after their death. These are the divine uh, uh, these are the divine doctrines of the Essenes about the soul, which lay an unavoidable bait for such as have once had a taste of their philosophy. Note, I believe if, if I'm just putting my personal belief on this, I believe elements of this are true, but I think it's more like, you know, it's not like dying and going to some other realm. I think just based on my personal study and what we talk about, and I'm sure you guys would have no problem agreeing with this. I think it's more like you keep coming here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like that's how I reincarnate. Oh, you were, you were bad this life. Right. Well, you're going to struggle more the next one, but it's going to teach you more. Uh huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it, it's cool to see how they believe. That's it. how I perceive that as well. They live very, Oh, this is crazy. Um, they lived very long lives because of perfect sobriety. I forgot to mention, they never drank wine. Mm. They, they considered it folly. They had an extremely clean diet. Most of them only ate bread, you know, every night or once a week. Yeah, they didn't even eat meat. They, they would eat meat, but it was like the, the more, the more uh, fanatical, you know. The, right, the, the more extreme they, ones. The, the cleaner the diet, the, or yeah. the more bland the diet. Right. Because they believed it's, you know, you're more spiritual. But there were reports of them eating meat. Um, they don't fear death and they have the utmost loyalty to God and absolute faith in eternal life after death from wars of the Jews to Josephus. They are long lived also. And so much that many of them live above a hundred years by means of the simplicity of their diet. Nay, as I think by means of their regular course of life, they observe also, they condemn the miseries of life and are above pain by the generosity of their mind. And as for death, if it will be for their glory, they esteem it better than living always. And indeed, our war with the Romans gave abundant evidence. I lost my spot because of astigmatism. <laughs> um, 
Oh, our war with the Romans gave abundant evidence what great souls they had in their trials, wherein, although they were tortured and distorted, burnt and torn to pieces, and went through all kinds of instruments of torment, that they might be forced either to blaspheme their legislator or to eat what was forbidden them, yet they could not be made to do any of it, not once to flatter their tormentors or to even shed a tear, but they smiled in their pains of torture and laughed to those whose scorn inflicted their torments upon them wow. and resigned up their souls with great alacrity as expecting to receive them again. Alchemy. Yep. Wow. What you're saying No, I said is, alacrity. No, 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 Oh, no. you're saying I'm alchemy. saying that, that he, they're literally saying they're like rejoicing and happy at the people who are trying to cause them harm. And torture like, them. And torture them. And that's alchemy. Right. You, you know what I mean? It's like changing your perception. It's, it's, that's. But also they're so strictly loyal to the order that they never, there's not a single report of them, you know, understand like they existed in a time where the Romans were massacring Jews oh. and Christians. Oh, around the world. Yeah. yeah. Hunting them down, torturing them, burning them, peeling their flesh off, oh, yeah. crucifying them on Scanning crosses. Them. Like yeah. we're talking about vicious, vicious, horrific murder. Yeah. And in all of that, them being tortured and killed and flayed alive, there's not a single report of them giving up their secrets but actually that they smiled and they embraced death to be one with the spirit. Yeah. Talk about spiritual people. What were you going to say? My angel? I interpreted that <laughs> as uh, um, <laughs> they didn't feel the pain. So, oh, wow. That too. Yeah, it said that. If, yeah. wow. They're above so pain because you, of their mind. you know, forgo all the, the goodness of life, you can become a superhero. It's like the... <laughs> It's like when Ryan set himself on fire because he didn't want to drink piss. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like the Tibetan monk. monks that set themselves on fire and don't feel pain. Okay, I'm actually, I'm almost done here, and I skipped a lot of texts. About, I went really text happy this time. But um, they had advanced prophecy abilities, which was actually recognized by several contemporaries of the time, as well as uh, it was reported that they were consulted by King Herod. There was a Herodian dynasty, which, you know, like in the time of Jesus being born, it was King Herod, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure who it was. Um, I think before Herod, it was the Maccabean dynasty. And that's when they had the Maccabean revolt and they threw, threw that dynasty out and then brought in the, the family of Herod. But it was reported that King Herod actually went and consulted the Essenes and had them that he had a bunch of different priests and I, I can't remember which text I read this in, but it was like the Essenes prophecy that they provided was the one that was correct. Whoa. They had advanced knowledge of prophecy. Damn. So even the King, which remember what we talked about, the Edgar Casey stuff said, Oh, well actually they had an ancient prophecy that they yep. would be the society that births the savior figure. What? You know what I'm saying? Dude, these people were bad. Ass. They, they were, yeah, they were next level. Um, oh, oh, I said from Wars of the Jews too. There are those among them who undertake to foretell things to come by reading the holy books and using several sorts of purifications and being perpetually conversant in the discourse of the prophets. And it is seldom that they miss in their predictions. Damn. They were split into different sects. We already talked about this earlier. One of the factions were all men completely celibate till death. The other faction married women, but check this out. I said married woman. They married woman. <laughs> it's funny because they had strict regulations about like marrying a partner. They had to date. They had to be engaged and date for three years and try out their spouse. That's very healthy. Right? That's very healthy. Right. Been there. <laughs> <laughs> they had to date for three years before that they could get married. That part I can do. <laughs> yeah, dude. Because they had to reject any notion that it was like some sort of you know, possible adulteress or, you know, crazy relationship. It had to be like Pure. partners that were equally matched and devoted to the same thing. Yeah. Now the crazy thing, which I think is like, okay, well you know, may, maybe this part's not necessary, <laughs> but when they, when, when their Essene wives were pregnant, they stayed away from them mm. and let them carry the child on their own because it was like, Oh no, I'm not in this for pleasure. We're doing, you know, what the great spirit or God or whatever gave us the power to create life. So mm. this is about that. Mm -hmm. So they would separate during pregnancy and childbirth and stuff like that. And I'm like, bro, how could you not be in the delivery room? Right. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, but it is yeah. what it is. I yeah. Mean, I get it. If, the, if, if you're trying to achieve what they were trying to achieve, 
Like the logic makes sense, but yeah. Well, oh. the furniture in the delivery room was tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> the cushions were just yeah. like, you know, they they had the slightest impression when you sat on them, yeah. <laughs> and the rugs were so coarse. They, yeah, that was funny. It says, moreover, there is another order of Essenes, talking about the Therapeutae in Alexandria, Egypt, who agree with the rest as to their way of living and customs and laws, but differ from them in the point of marriage, as thinking that by not marrying, they cut off the principal part of human life, which is the prospect of succession. Mm. Nay, rather that if all men should be of the same opinion, the whole race of mankind would fail. However, they try their spouses for three years. And if they find that they have their natural purgations thrice as trials that they are likely to be fruitful, they then actually marry them. But they do not use to accompany with their wives when they are with child as a demonstration that they do not marry out of regard to pleasure, but for the sake of posterity. Now the women go into the baths with some of their garments on as the men do with somewhat girded about them. And these are the customs of this order of Essenes. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's all my notes. It's, it's crazy, right? Yeah, it's it's completely unbelievable. So, in summary, it, it sounds like this is potentially the most ancient wisdom tradition who is trying to, like, crack the code of spiritual reality. And also, they really don't like comfy pillows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they wear the plainest white robes. No, but but in, in, in seriousness, these were the pioneers of our spiritual understanding of this realm. And all those that came after them are like, listen up to these guys. Like the people that we talk about in, in terms of modern wisdom traditions are doing almost everything, almost the same. I just had a revelation. Yeah, for sure. Almost, almost everything. The, the, the knowledge is the same. Yes. You know, yes. maybe not all the practices. Cause right. in modern times we're like, well, you know, it's like, it's okay to it, like, be with your spouse. They, that, that's all right. It's okay to be in the delivery room. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's okay to like have comfy pillows. Like I, you know, there's definitely a morph over modern times, yeah, which certainly, I like. Certainly. But no, I just had the craziest thought too. Like we've already established through historical fact that there was a chapter of the Essenes in Egypt, and we know from the biblical text that when Jesus was born, the King Herod, because remember he was consulted by the Magi. And they were like, oh, it's the star of the prophecy. Yeah. The star's here. There's, the, you know, the Savior's born. And King Herod's like, oh, fuck. Like, <laughs> I want to kill him. Yeah, yeah. The, the Jewish prophecy, one of the reasons that contemporary Jews of the time, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees especially, especially the Sadducees, they hated Jesus so much because he wasn't the Messiah that was according to the prophecy of the Jews. Right. Because the Messiah prophecy was that he would be a royal king. Right. Jesus was not. Right, exactly. He was just a, a normal dude. He was a carpenter, mm -hmm. you know? And they hated him. They didn't believe him to be, you know... Like, they, they were like, this is your guy? Right. Like, this, exactly. really, this Ex is your guy? Exactly. So King Herod, when Jesus was born, was like, because of this, this, this prophecy that the Messiah would be the next king, mm. right? It would be this king who liberated the... He's like, find him, kill him. Exactly. He's like, no, no, I'm the king. Yeah. So that, that's why he did it. He was like, no, no, me. I don't want anybody born who's going to challenge my dynasty. So he put out a decree. Have all the babies killed. Yep. All the babies from zero to two years old. The like, male ones. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Kill them all. Yeah. So we know in the story that when Jesus was born, they sent him to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Whoa, dude, we just realized. <laughs> I always wondered, where'd he go? There was a chapter of Essenes. That's pretty interesting. I mean, you know, we don't know for sure, but, but it's interesting. They sent him there, and there's a lot of people that think he was an Essene. Yeah. And him and John were doing some Essene shit. Yeah, and then it's like you get into... And there's a 30-year gap. Uh, like, exactly. Wh what was he doing during that time? Right. You know what I'm saying? It's, it starts to click. That's, that's the cross-referencing I'm talking about. Like, pull the stuff from everywhere, cross-reference it, figure it out. Like, were they allowed to work out? Did you read about that? I don't know if the Essenes were. I, I don't know. Why would they do well, that? But I mean, do they eat bread was, like once a week, bro? They but, probably... <laughs> no, but Jesus was ripped. Well, he... Oh, that's and, true. You can infer <laughs> Well, he was a carpenter. He got right, ripped. Yeah. Did, he, well, he, he might have gone off in these 30 years and got jacked. 
Well, he probably got jacked like living in the commune with the Essenes, like being a blacksmith. <laughs> Smiling or a and doing yeah. labor and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. Singing their songs. It's all starting to make sense. He yeah. got jacked lifting up logs. and like he We was know car- he was jacked. <laughs> it just makes sense. It does. And we know he drank Natty Light, too. Yeah. Like, we know yeah. all that. That was the one thing about the Essenes he rejected. Because he's like, y'all ain't drinking Natty Light? That's crazy, though, because the Essenes <laughs> rejected wine. But then it's like, well, damn. Jesus' well, first miracle. Yep. Was turning water to wine. Yep. You know, so it's like plot hole. But <laughs> I feel like everybody would have just turned a blind eye to Jesus if he brought some wine up in the commune. Right. They'd be like, oh, I would drink wine with Jesus. That's yeah. Jesus. Yeah. You know? yeah. I we could. Hey, we ain't worried about it. Yeah. I would definitely drink wine with Jesus. Well, fuck yeah. Who I'd drink wouldn't? wine with you. Who wouldn't? I, I, we probably have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least once or so. Yeah. But no, it's crazy. And then you have all the like Edgar Casey stuff and, um, even like Dolores Cannon and even like the theosophy stuff and all these other like not only like psychics in, in, in the last hundred years, but like these secret society traditions like the theosophists, the Rosicrucians, the Masons, et cetera, et cetera, that are all like, oh, no, dude. Yeah. Like Jesus was a part of an order and went to the temple um, in Alexandria, Egypt. Yeah. Of the Great White Brotherhood. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. But we know that the Essenes from historical fact had a chapter near alexandria egypt it's like this mix of like it's like three layers here it's like we have the legend as well as like what is said by the secret societies of modern times we have these historical documents that are corroborating that they definitely were mystics and then we have the psychics who are like oh no yeah like this 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 and we know for a fact that the essenes history was wiped out so obviously there's going to be lots of gaps right so right. it would only be logical to try to fill those gaps in with what we do know. Right. And what we do know lines up very pointedly to, like, maybe Jesus was an Essene. Like, it seems pretty legit. Well, I have no, you know, trouble believing that. For me, the bigger picture here is, like, the Enoch thing. It, that, too. You know what I mean? What I, there's lots of gaps to like, be filled. Yeah, like, I already believe in my mind about, you know, the Jesus Essene thing, Jesus being an Essene. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For me, it's like, was Enoch Hermes Trismegistus? He, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's the big question. Right. And so, this lends itself pretty heavily to support that. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. I don't know. Wow. 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 Banger, dude. Banger. <laughs> <laughs> Banger. <laughs> Banger. <laughs> I love that. Like, just had, like, the most spiritually profound, like, in-depth, intelligent conversation, and this is how we end it. Yeah. Banger. It's a banger. <laughs> you know what we should do, man? What? We should We should do a little soft plug right now. Okay. Um, We have... We this... have new tolerably comfortable pillows coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually it's it's actually cushion that um we take from the rear end of horses <laughs> yeah. and we stitch it together to make them c- kind know, of not that wait, soft. Right. No, that's <laughs> not very soft. So you, you've been using horses, but you told me to cut my hair to make the pillows? No nobody told you to cut your hair. You did that because you wanted to. No, Ryan said cut your hair, we're gonna make pillows. <laughs> oh you did? <laughs> yeah, actually we were thinking about <laughs> <laughs> what? We were actually thinking about taking his hair and fucking stuffing pillows. <laughs> <laughs> that would make a tolerably comfortable pillow. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. A little more than tolerably. Nah, not much. Not much. A greasy hair-filled pillow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I would sleep on it. Dude, that was <laughs> that was a banger. You, Heck yeah. You delivered hard. Appreciate it. Now we're going to go uh, switch out costumes Touch of makeup, and then we're going to do the next section, yep. which is spirit science. Spirit science. That's oh, coming up. soft plug. We do. We have a Patreon. I feel like we rarely ever plug this on the show. Uh, Patreon, it's just Bledsoe Said So, or you could find it on BledsoeSaidSo.com. We have an amazing Discord community in there. And, it's and an like, extra show. Yep, and an extra show, and, you know, potentially some more mm-hmm. um, around the corner. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's it's awesome, and it's, it's, it's a way, like, it, it, it's a way to help out the show. And if, if you don't want to do that, that's totally cool. Just listening to the show helps us regardless. Absolutely. You know, but we get a lot of questions. How can we help? Huge fan. Want to send support. So check and it Bledsoe out. And so Bledsoe.com for some tolerable merch. Yeah, it is tolerable. We should put that as, as like on the thing. Tolerable. We should just make a shirt that's like just literally just like burlap. 
<laughs> well, yeah, but but it's all white. Yeah. <laughs> like no logo, no yes. nothing. Uh, no print. Dude. Yes. That's epic. All right, let's hit them with it. All right. Three, two, one. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more, check out our other videos. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe. See you next week. Peace. Peace.